everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Arnold and Porter Government Contracts Moot Court Competition. My name is Jessica Teltman, and I am the Assistant Dean for Government Procurement Law Studies here at GW Law School. The Arnold and Porter Moot Court Competition is a signature event at, uh, of the GW Law Government Procurement Law Program that we've been hosting for over 20 years at the law school. The competition is open to both JD and LLM students and it also is part of an experiential course that we offer at the law school taught by Judge Jerry Summers, who I'll be introducing momentarily. I wanna thank all of the students for their incredibly hard work this semester in their course and to congratulate all of you on how well you did this past weekend during the first and second rounds of the competition. And also a hearty congratulations to the finalists who are here arguing the case today. I wish you the best of luck during today's final round. I would also like to thank Judge Solomson, Smith and Lester for taking time out of your very busy schedules to join us today. And finally, I wanna thank Arnold and Porter for your generous contributions to the law school and longstanding support of this competition and our students. Now, I would like to introduce the two individuals who will be leading tonight's program. First, I'd like to introduce Judge Jerry Summers. Judge Jerry Summers is the chair of the Civilian Board of Contract Appeals, where she has been a judge since 2007. Judge Summers is also a professorial lecturer in law here at GW Law School, where she not only teaches the moot court class, but also our government contracts advocacy course, as well as judicial lawyering. I don't think I forgot anything there, did I, Judge Summers? No, okay, she teaches a lot of courses at our school. Um, and then I'd also like to introduce her co-host for the evening, Victoria Kristoff. I am delighted to introduce our incoming visiting associate professor of law and government procurement law fellow, Victoria Kristoff. Uh, prior to joining us here as our brand new program fellow, um, uh, Victoria uh, clerked for Judge Horn at the U.S. Court of Federal Claims, and then for Judge Jimmy uh, Reyna at the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. So welcome to Victoria, and thank you and Judge Summers for hosting us tonight. Um, with that, I'm going to go turn it over to Judge Summers and uh, Victoria to kick things off for tonight's program. Great. Thank you, Jessica. I will be um, sh starting a PowerPoint presentation. Um, let's see. Okay, great. Thank you once again. Um, my name is Victoria Kristoff, and welcome to the 2021 Arnold and Porter Government Contracts Moot Court Competition. The case for this year's competition is called Democracy Worldwide versus the United States. It is my pleasure to introduce our distinguished panel of judges for tonight's event. First up, we have the Honorable Matthew Solomson. Judge Solomson is a judge at the United States Court of Federal Claims. He recently entered duty at the court in February of 2020. Judge Solomson received a BA in economics from Brandeis University and his JD and MBA from the University of Maryland. Prior to joining the court, Judge Solomson practiced government procurement law in the private sector and in the government. While in private practice, Judge Solomson served as the Chief Legal and Compliance Officer for a large federal contracting business unit of a Fortune 50 healthcare company. Judge Solomson also worked as in-house counsel at Booz Allen Hamilton. His private practice experience also includes having served as counsel in the government contracts and litigation practice groups of Sidley Austin and as an associate with Arnold and Porter. While in the government, Judge Solomson served as a, trial, as a trial attorney for the National Court Section of the Commercial Litigation Branch of the United States Department of Justice. Thank you for joining us today, Judge Solomson. Next up, we have the Honorable Harold Lester. Judge Lester is a judge at the Civilian Board of Contract Appeals. He has been a member of the board since July 2014. He received his BA in Economics and Business Administration from Furman University and his JD from Washington and Lee University. Prior to joining the board, Judge Lester spent most of his career at the National Court Section at the Commercial Litigation Branch at the U.S. Department of Justice. While there, he was a trial attorney for several years and then the Assistant Branch Director. Judge Lester then served as counsel at Vetter Price. Thank you for judging us, uh, for joining us, Judge Lester. And last but not least is the Honorable Brian Smith. Judge Smith is a judge at the Armed Services Board of Contract Appeals, and he was very recently entered duty at the board this year. 
Judge Smith has a degree in sociology from Virginia Tech and a JD from Vanderbilt Law School. He began his little legal career as a litigation associate at Piper and Marbury, which we now know as DLA Piper. And like his co-judges tonight, Judge Smith also spent time as a trial attorney at the National Court Section of the Commercial Litigation Branch at the DOJ. From there, he worked as division counsel at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in Honolulu, Hawaii, and then as senior trial counsel for the Navy Litigation Office in D.C. Thank you so much, judges, for joining us tonight, and I will pass the mic over to Judge Summers to introduce our competitors for this year. Well, thank you. Um, first, we have representing the appellant, um, DW, is Stuart Anderson. Um, Stuart is an LLM candidate at GW. He currently works as a veterans law attorney for the Department of Veterans Affairs Office of General Counsel. He's a 2009 graduate of Columbia Law School and a former active duty and current reservist JAG in the United States Air Force. Um, Jane Hahn is um, a 2L at GW. This summer, she will join um, Fox Rothschild as a summer associate. Next, we have representing the United States, Benjamin Whitlow, who is a 3L at GW. He currently serves as the senior production editor for the George Washington University Law um, Review and the executive committee member of the GW Law Moot Court Board. After graduation, Benjamin will be joining Pillsbury um, Winthrop Shaw Pittman LLP as an associate in McLean, um, Virginia. Finally, we have Madison Plummer, um, also representing the United States. She's a 3L at GW, serves as the notes editor for the Public Contract Law Journal, and was the 2020 recipient of the um, Judge Ruth C. Berg Scholarship for Government Procurement Law. Following graduation, she will join Nichols Lou LLP as an associate. Thank you. And before we start tonight's um, oral argument, we just wanted to provide you with a brief summary of the procedural history of the case. Um, once again, the case name is Democracy Worldwide versus the United States. Um, in about January 2020, USA, the agency at issue, awarded Democracy Worldwide a $2 million grant for human rights training in Cameroon. During performance of the grant and after COVID-19 became a global pandemic, Democracy Worldwide incurred costs for masks and hand washing stations. The agency disallowed these costs, noting that the grant agreement did not cover these costs and that Democracy Worldwide did not seek the agreement officer's approval. Democracy Worldwide then sued the agency for these costs before the Court of Federal Claims, giving rise to the lower court decision at issue in this appeal. Before the Court of Federal Claims, there were two issues in dispute. Did Democracy Worldwide um, bring a claim that was within the court's jurisdiction under the Tucker Act. And the second issue was whether it, um, democracy worldwide could recover its costs. The lower court determined um, that it did have jurisdiction over the claim, but that democracy worldwide could not recover its costs. Um, democracy worldwide appealed that decision to the federal circuit, which you'll be hearing the oral argument on this, on this case in a few moments. Um, democracy worldwide will argue that the lower court does have jurisdiction over its claim and that his costs were allowable. In contrast, the government will argue that the lower court did not have jurisdiction and that DW's costs were not allowable. With that, we are excited to get the show started. Good luck to all of our competitors. I will remove this presentation and hand it over to our panel of judges. Thank you. Um, all right, <clears throat> I'm Judge Lester. Uh, we are here today to hear the argument in Democracy Worldwide versus U.S. Agency of International Development, number case number 20-782C. Uh, Mr. Anderson and Ms. Hahn, you're representing the appellant today. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. And I take it you're splitting the argument. Uh, I, I, have to admit, I am not positive who's handling which arguments. So uh, I'm, if you could clear that, clarify that, that would be great. Yes, Your Honor. I will be handling the jurisdictional question and uh, Ms. Hahn will do the factual dispute. Right. And Mr. Whitlow and Ms. Plummer? Yes, that's correct. And how will you, I take it you're also splitting the argument. Who, who is handling which? Yes, I will be handling the jurisdictional issue, Your Honor. Um, I take it everyone knows how the clock is going to work. Is that right? 
great. And um, just for clarification, there is a timer and we're taking care of that. That's great. And um, just for my knowledge too, I have to admit, I don't know, is, is there a rebuttal period? Is there time being reserved for that? Or are we just going straight? Uh, Judge Lester, so there will be um, each participant gets 15 minutes, um, so 30 minutes per side, and then the appellant side has the option of reserving a rebuttal, and they should note at the outset if that's what they would like to do. All right, great. Um, so um, I'm here with Judge Smith, Judge Solomon, uh, both of whom I've known for a long time. So um, why don't we go ahead and get started with uh, you, Mr. Anderson? And uh, I hand the floor over to you. May it please the court. Good evening, I'm Stuart Anderson. Together with my co-counsel, Jane Hahn, I represent the appellant, Democracy Worldwide. Uh, may I please reserve two minutes for rebuttal after I argue the jurisdictional question? Certainly. Thank you, Your Honor. The Court of Federal Claims correctly found that it had jurisdiction over this dispute and gave democracy worldwide to challenge the, uh, the opportunity to challenge the disallowance of the costs it occurred carrying out USAID's mission of, of civil society development in West Africa under COVID conditions. This decision was correct for three reasons. First, the regulations governing the administration of the grant are a money mandating source of law. Second, the grant itself is a contract and a separate money mandating source of law. And third, democracy worldwide seeks money damages, a form of relief that the Court of Federal Claims can provide. Turning first to the question of the regulation as a money mandating source of authority, this is required because the Tucker Act provides a waiver of sovereign immunity and jurisdiction to the Court of Federal Claims over claims against the United States based on constitution, statute, regulation, or contract, but it does not provide the substantive. Uh, the Cap substantive counsel, counsel, if I if I can interrupt, I have I have two factual questions that are going to uh, be relevant to the rest of your argument, your co-counsel argument, and the other side's argument. So I want to pose them to you first. Um, first, the, the COVID expenses, my understanding is that they were approximately $10,000. How does that compare to the total expenses um, for the supplies in the two supply items in the budget, or, or does the record not um, give you that information? Uh, Your Honor, the, the, the record only provides the information regarding the overall cost, not the uh, individual cost for the line of item supplies. So, so you're you're saying the overall cost, meaning the two million dollar not to exceed figure in the grant? Yes, Your Honor. All right, and then so ten, the COVID expenses were ten thousand dollars. So if we're trying to do a comparison, and I notice that the word significantly um, is is relevant to all of the arguments that are presented here, we could compare that ten thousand dollar figure to the two million dollar figure. Do do you believe that's the appropriate comparison for looking at the word significantly? Yes, Your Honor, and that is a matter that my co-counsel uh, will direct um, or will address directly. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, can I, turning Mr. To Anderson, question, Mr. Anderson, can I just ask, so why, why, why does it matter whether these regulations are money making or not? I, I mean, you have a, allegedly a contract. What does the money mandating aspect of the regulations have to do with whether we have jurisdiction or not? Your Honor, the, the Court of Federal Claims to have jurisdiction must find some source of money mandating authority, and it could be either the grant as a contract or these regulations as a money mandating source of law. But if you either one of them, but, but if you have a contract, I mean, what are I mean, you the money? The regulations don't provide jurisdiction or don't provide any authority to this to democracy worldwide unless they have a contract. So. Are, are you arguing that the regulations in and of themselves provide jurisdiction here without the existence of a contract? Yes, Your Honor. Um, the, the, uh, the Tucker Act provides jurisdiction for uh, a claim based on a statute or a regulation or a contract. It does not require there to be a statute in conjunction well, with a contract true. or a regulation in conjunction with a contract. That's true, but if we find that the contract here is 
similar to the contract that issue in Rick's mushroom. Isn't it over for you? Your Honor, I apologize. I couldn't, I couldn't hear. You're, you're yeah, a little quiet, Matt. Oh, or is just, that better? A little louder, please, sir. Sorry. sorry, my question is, if, if, can you hear me now okay? Yes, I can hear. Okay, my question is, but if we find that the contract at issue here is similar or governed by the contract at issue in Rick's mushroom, doesn't that end our inquiry? It's over for you. Uh, your Honor, uh, it, it does not because the the um, the relevant section of the decision in Rick's mushroom, which was the requirement that the contract um, provide a direct benefit to the party, um, it was one aspect of that decision. And the other aspect was the um, was the analysis of the difference between a cooperative agreement and a contract. Um, the first issue does not bear on this case. The, the finding or the requirement or direct benefit because Rick's Mushroom required a direct benefit in order for a contract to be a procurement contract under the Contract Disputes Act, um, not a contract in the general sense. This court has taken a different approach to determining whether a contract exists with the government, looking rather at the common law elements of a contract with the addition of requirement for actual authority. And Your Honor, the other issue under Rick's Mushroom was the question of the comparability of the cooperative agreement to a contract. And in, in that case, um, what we would be asking here is simply what is the better analogy between the agreement at hand, uh, a cooperative agreement, which was found to not be a procurement contract, um, or um, under the test laid out by this court in El Centro, for example, um, does it simply meet the common law elements required for the existence of a contract? Well, no, I mean, normally, normally a grant is not a contract. I mean, it's a grant. It's, it's a giving of money for whatever purpose, but it's not typically a contract. I understand from Thermalon and some other cases that it can, a grant can be a contract in certain instances, what about this particular grant turns it into a contract? Your Honor, the, the sequence of events uh, of the formation of the grant agreement is what establishes the existence of consideration. So um, the, the only of the elements of a, of a contract, the only one that's in dispute effectively is the question of consideration. And in this case, the sequence of events provides that because USAID published its notice of funding opportunity, um, seeking programs to further its mission of uh, democracy development in West Africa. Democracy Worldwide created this proposal in response to that notice of funding opportunity. And then when that proposal was selected, carried out the proposal after USAID agreed to fund it. Right, so that, I mean, that's what, that, that's what would happen with any grant. I mean, what, what's different about this one? I mean, what consideration is there to the government what does the government get out of this that, that is sufficient to provide consideration to establish a contract beyond, as opposed to just a grant? Well, Your Honor, what, what the government gets is that democracy worldwide does something that it would not have otherwise done, carries out a program that did not otherwise exist in furtherance of USAID's mission in exchange for USAID's promise to um, pay the money. That is a mutual exchange of promises, um, which is the definition of consideration in the common law sense. The, the requirement for I mean, the direct- the bottom, line is, bottom line is, is you don't think that it has to be a procurement contract for us to have jurisdiction or for the Court of Federal Claims to have jurisdiction. Yes, Your Honor, that's correct. But, and, but what, do, what do you think the benefit to the government is from this? contract that would establish jurisdiction or is, Your Honor, sorry, the, consideration? Your Honor, the benefit is the furtherance of USAID mission. Um, the existence of the mission is uh, a creation of, of, of statute. Um, so questioning that is not really what this dispute is about. Um, but given that USAID has this particular mission, 
um, democracy worldwide is doing something on its behalf in exchange for money to carry it out. And the, uh, one of the arguments that was in the brief talked about the, one of the arguments was that there's nothing in this contract that provides some substantive right to money damages. How do you respond to that? I mean, what, what in this contract provides a right to relief in the, in the way that you're asking? Your Honor, um, the, the contract or, or the existence of a right to money damages under a contract is viewed the same as that question is viewed for a statute of regulation, which is to say it can either be explicit or it can be implied. Um, the bar for a contract is even lower, however, in as much as a party to a contract goes armed with the presumption of the availability of money damages. And so in this case, Democracy Worldwide has that presumption and the grant agreement between them and USAID incorporated not only the proposal, but the budget with the specific line items and the cost associated. Uh, and so that implies the right when democracy worldwide is challenging the disallowance of costs under that budget and those line items to- What is your best case from this court distinguishing the agreement at issue in Rick's Mushroom from the agreement at issue in this case? The, um, well, Your Honor, the, the chief difference between the two is the so what, what, is your best, what is your best case? What is your best authority from the federal circuit? Your Honor, the, the best authority to distinguish this case from Rick's Mushroom is, um, I, would, I would say Anderson versus United States, but that is because that is a decision by the federal circuit that applies the test, the common law test for the existence of a contract rather than Rick's Mushroom where they never actually got to the question of whether it was a contract. They were looking rather at the question of whether it was a procurement contract based on the particular theory raised by the plaintiff appellant in that case. And, and if we're talking about a apples to apples comparison of why this contract is not like that cooperative agreement, it lies in the, the concept of consideration itself, whereby a unilateral offer of money is not consideration for the existence of the contract. And it's important to note that the court in Rick's Mushroom did not arrive at that point. But in Rick's Mushroom, Rick's, the, um, Rick's Mushroom was already engaging in a for-profit enterprise um, for which the NRSC offered reimbursement. And so if this court had to go back and revisit that case under the theory or under the, the law articulated in Anderson or El Centro, um, it would have the tool of consideration to make a distinction between a unilateral promise and uh, an enforceable contract with consideration. Can I just ask you to then to go back to your the regulations? I, I'm, I'm, I'm still somewhat confused as to why it's important for those to be money mandating. And, and how they are money mandating. Well, Your Honor, the, the reason it's important is because um, the existence of a money mandating regulation in this case would be a sufficient basis to find that Tucker Act jurisdiction exists. Um, it, but essentially- only have a, but That's only true if you have a claim that's based on those provisions directly. We only get to those provisions if we first find that there's a contract, correct? Your Honor, the if the claim is based on the regulations that govern the the grant administration, then you could actually just decide on the basis of the existence of the or that the uniform guidance governing this grant administrate this grant is a uh, money mandating regulation. That would be a sufficient basis to decide the case in its own right. Mr. Anderson, I believe your time is up. Uh, we will, you went just a little bit over, but we will allow you to retain your uh, two minutes of rebuttal. Uh, Thank you. Ms. Hahn. Uh, 
Good evening, Your Honors. May it please the court. My name is Jane Han, and I'm the counsel for Appellant Democracy Worldwide. We ask the court to reverse the decisions from the Court of Federal Claims on matters related to factual dispute for the following three reasons. First, purchase of COVID-19 PPE during the pandemic was reasonable, and the prior approval by the agreement officer was not required. Second, even if the prior approval by DAO was required, here, DAO ratified the purchase through an email, and so the cost was allowable. Finally, the cost Count, risk- count, Counsel, let me, uh, sorry, forgive me for interrupting, but um, let me follow up on the question that I asked your co-counsel uh, about the amount of the expenses, uh, approximately $10,000 in PPE or COVID expenses, um, and I understand your position is that, or one of your positions is that the, those costs were, were per se allowable as um, supplies necessary for daily operations. Is that one of your arguments? Yes, Your Honor, that is one of our argument. Um, in so, that part well, hold on. So, so in order to evaluate reasonableness, I'd really like to compare the $10,000 number with the number uh, in the budget for supplies, but I can't find that number in the record. Um, am I misreading the record or is that um, a, a, absent, a gap in the record? Your Honor, the $10,445 are an accumulation of masks, hand sanitization, um, nursing consulting fees, thermometers, and uh, extra sanitization. And and those line items have accumulated to in total of $10,445. Right, right, I understand that. But um, if you were saying that they were reasonable in comparison to a budget line item for um, supplies necessary for daily operations and that budget was $100, that would be very different than if that budget was $20,000 or $50,000, don't, don't you agree? Your Honor, um, price is one of the factors that determine the reasonableness of allowable costs. Um, the other factors that determine the reasonableness of costs include necessity and what a prudent person would have done under the similar circumstances. So while $10,000 might sound unreasonable at hand, Considering the entire factors that the Code of Federal Regulations require to determine the reasonableness, in fact, shows that the COVID-19 PPE purchase was reasonable. Right, but I think what Judge Smith is asking is what is the relevance of the budget that, in, that you've agreed to with the government? And don't we have to compare what you spent to what you budgeted in particular line items? Or are you saying that you're not limited at all by the budget so long as the purchases were reasonable, allowable, and allocable, it doesn't matter what you spent on that. Your, Your Honor, that question pertains to uh, one of our arguments, which is the cost risk um, associated with the case at hand. And, and there, our argument is that this grant agreement was more like cost reimbursement contract, because in effect, we did have $2 million of our so, so cap amount. What was the relevance of the budget then? Yes, Your Honor. So the relevance of the budget was the fact that democracy worldwide could incur costs as long as it's reasonable and ask for cost reimbursement associated with those costs as long as they were initially defined in the grant agreement. Well, well and that's exactly why I'm asking the questions I'm asking. If, if the the cost for PPE uh, or PPE itself can be characterized as necessary for the daily operations and the cost was within scope of that budget, then my reading of the agreement was that you didn't even need to seek uh, approval prior to incurring those expenses. They, they were within your discretion to, uh, to purchase pens and ink and other items that were necessary for daily operations without asking anything of the contracting officer. Is, is that the way the agreement works? Yes, Your Honor. In fact, that is our very argument that here the prior approval was not required because the fact that 
the plain language of the original agreement clearly enlisted um, any item that was necessary to carry out the daily operations and COVID-19 PPE was exactly any other items that was necessary to carry out well, the daily operations. But, but what, what you're saying is directly contrary to the regular or the, I don't know, it was a regulation, but the pamphlet that AID put out uh, early on in COVID saying that if anybody is going to start buying things to deal with COVID, they need to get written approval from the AOR and the AAO before they incur those. I mean, did they just, I mean, did, did Democracy Worldwide just ignore that or just think that it was not, that, that that was not relevant to its ability to incur costs? Your Honor, the USAID guideline directed program awardees to contact AO or AOR if the COVID-19 PPE would have significant impact on the budget. The lower court based its decision relying on this very clause in the USAID guideline. However, their interpretation of this clause was clearly wrong because the lower court failed to analyze that Democracy Worldwide's COVID-19 PPE purchase, in fact, did not have significant impact on the budget. Well, and but I, I thought your argument was, I thought your argument was that regardless of that, you could spend the money however you wanted to, so long as it was reasonable. I mean, doesn't it have to be reasonable in accordance with the specific terms of the grant? And the grant sort of limited what kind of supplies you could get. I, how, how can you just, how could Democracy Worldwide ignore that and just incur costs and expect them to be reimbursed at its own whim? Your Honor, um, yes. Yes, in the fact that the cost still had to meet the reasonable standard as defined by the Code of Federal Regulations. Um, and that is the very reason why um, the cost itself is not the only factor that determines the reasonableness of the allowable costs. Um, here, the costs, uh, uh, the price itself did not have significant impact on the entire budget. So in first case, the prior approval by the AO was not required. In terms of defining the reasonableness um, in our case, the so, so hold on. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Just before you go away from that, what you just said, it did not have um, impact on the overall budget. That's another um, item from the record that I'm unsure of, and I want you to confirm or deny. Did, did Democracy Worldwide uh, exceed the two million dollar grant by the cost of the PPE, or is the PPE something that was uh, within the uh, the overall? budget, if you will, that is the total not to exceed figure. Yes, Your Honor, the $10,445 was within the $2 million budget. And um, this cost was only incurred during the first training. So it did not exceed the entire budget amount, which was the $2 million. In our case, Democracy Worldwide acted prudently when it consulted with AOR prior to making COVID-19 PPE purchase. Your, I'm sorry, does your argument depend on the language that, um, that there is a budget item for assorted office supplies and anything necessary to daily operations? Does your argument hinge on what the phrase anything necessary to daily operations means? Yes, Your Honor. Um, COVID-19 PPE was precisely anything that was necessary to daily operations. Right, but if, if we disagree with that, do you lose? We still have an argument that um, regardless, the prior approval was not required by the AO because the budget itself did not have significant impact on the overall amount of the budget. But this in this case- approval. This is not about approval. This is about whether or not it's an allowable cost or allocable. Uh, Your Honor, COVID-19 PPE, um, as uh, opposing counsel noted in the brief, um, may only relate to the office supplies. Even if we do read that anything necessary to the daily operations is only limited to the office supplies, the trade practice can be um, used to interpret the ambiguous language in the contract. And the trade practice during COVID-19 pandemic clearly illustrates that 
COVID-19 PPE was in fact part of the office supplies because in trade practice, office supply chains carry COVID-19 PPE in their store during the pandemic. Moreover, during the pandemic, it was necessary um, for- But that, that didn't, that, was that true when the grant was awarded? Your Honor, um, when the grant was awarded, the COVID-19 uh, the COVID-19 pandemic hasn't started, um, but the trade usage and practice is not limited to the time, but it comes was in that, into- I, I, would, I have to ask, was that an argument that you raised in your brief? Because I don't remember seeing it in there. Uh, no, Your Honor, it wasn't uh, an argument that was, the, the trade usage itself was not raised in the argument itself but the interpretation of anything necessary um, has been raised in the opinion and um, I'm supplying the trade usage canons to make the argument. What about the, what about the canon of, and my Latin is not the best, but uh, ed, ed, generis, that when you have a cat's off phrase at the end, it should be read to be similar to all of the other items in the list. Yes, Your Honor, um, that is in fact part of the argument that the opposing counsel has noted in the brief. Um, and, and so along with the uh, judimus um, generis, the trade usage comes into the interpretation along with that. And that is the very reason why anything necessary to daily operations during the pandemic relates to the trade practice during the COVID-19 pandemic. Ms. Han, let me, um, I'm going to ask you to jump to another topic. You have argued in your brief that this was really a cost reimbursement grant. We should interpret this as a cost reimbursement contract. And in your brief, you say the risk of COVID is on the government. Why, why is the risk on the government rather than on democracy worldwide? Your Honor, the cost risk should be allocated to the USAID because the grant award in our case was more like cost reimbursement contract rather than the fixed price contract. Um, the FAR provision 16.304 states that in cost reimbursement contract, contractor provides notice to the government if contractor expects to um, have a differing prices. Here, the very fact that democracy worldwide provided notice to the government for its spending shows that the grant was a more like cost reimbursement rather than a fixed price contract. But it didn't, it didn't notify the AO, did it? Didn't it only notify the AOR? As the USAID guideline um, mentioned in joint appendix page 130, uh, Democracy Worldwide could notify AO or AOR for um, cost COVID-19 PPE matters. I, I thought it said AOR and AO rather than just one. Um, um, Your Honor, the joint appendix refers to AO or AOR, but in any case, in our case, AO has ratified the purchase um, for the COVID-19 PPE because she uh, read the entire email chain AOR had forwarded to her and has knowingly ratified the purchase itself. Is that all it takes is to see some emails? And I mean, what, I, I mean, ratification is a fairly rare um, event. Uh, is that all it takes is for her to read the emails? Was there anything else in the record that shows any kind of adoption or acceptance of or agreement to reimburse the costs that for PPE? Uh, Your Honor, yes, the ratification standard uh, requires that the AO have fully known the material facts surrounding the unauthorized action of her subordinate. And here, because the very standard requires for AO to know the unauthorized action of her subordinate, the fact that AO had the entire email chain from AOR shows that she did in fact have the material facts surrounding the unauthorized action of the AOR. In addition, um, AO further noted in her email that, quote unquote, please inform DW any PP purchase needs to comply with the guidance on the USAID website, which her language shows that she knowingly ratified the PPE purchase. And AO further noted- There's more than just PPE involved though, isn't there? It's also 
$3,500 for a nurse's consulting fee, correct? Yes, Your Honor. There, there is a consulting fee for um, nurses. And a facility fee, an additional facility fee as well for the conference space, correct? Yes, Your Honor. And those are definitely not office supplies or things for daily operations, right? That's, that's not, those are not items. If I may continue, Your Honor. You, you, uh, you can answer the question and then-, uh, then I apologize. Please. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Your Honor, yes, uh, for COVID-19 PPE, Democracy Worldwide included under the section, um, anything necessary to the daily operations for the nursing consulting fees, Democracy Worldwide included under the consulting fees. Um, and so still, uh, Democracy Worldwide was not amending the agreement because it was budgeted under the correct line items. All right, well, thank you, Ms. Hahn. Thank you, Mr. Anders, uh, Mr. Anderson. Thank uh, you, Your Honor. Now move, we will now move to the uh, appellee. Um, and I think Ms. Plummer, you said you were addressing the jurisdictional issue, is that correct? Yes, Your Honor, that's correct. All right, so whenever you are ready. Thank you. Good evening, Your Honors, and may it please the court. My name is Madison Plummer, and I, along with my co-counsel, Benjamin Whitlow, represent the United States Agency for International Development. We respectfully request that this court dismiss appellant's claim for lack of subject matter jurisdiction. In the alternative, should this court find jurisdiction, we request that the court affirm the disallowance of appellant's costs. This case is about protecting taxpayer dollars by maintaining the integrity of the federal grant award programs. Any waiver of sovereign immunity must be unequivocally expressed. Appellant grantee seeks to undermine and overbroaden this principle by bringing their claim before the Court of Federal Claims. However, the claims court lacked jurisdiction for three main reasons. First, sovereign immunity can only be waived expressly. Second, the Tucker Act does not grant jurisdiction here because there is no distinct substantive right for money damages. And third, the lower court's analysis is fundamentally flawed and should be overturned because this is not, nor is this similar to, a procurement contract. Can I ask you about the second point uh, where you said there's no distinct right to money damages? I mean, normally, don't we pretty much assume that if, if it's a contract, there, the remedy is money damages? What, what more do we need? If, if we were to find this is a contract, what more would we need to find, to, to find a money remedy or an entitlement to a money remedy? Yes, Your Honor. So my answer is twofold. It is the case that if this were a traditional contract, that the presumption would be money damages. However, here, consent to suit under the Tucker Act does not extend to every contract. And the fact that this is a grant agreement shows that there's a different purpose. And contrary to my opposing counsel's argument, there is no direct consideration, which is a determinative element for requiring jurisdiction. Ms. Plummer, in our earlier decision in total medical management, which is a panel decision that predates uh, Rick's Mushroom, this court said as follows, I'll, I'll read it to you. It says the government also argues that the resource sharing agreements are not contracts because they are not labeled contracts in the regulatory scheme. However, the failure of Congress to use the word contract does not preclude the holding that a binding contract is formed, citing Thermalon with approval, in which the Federal Circuit described that case as holding that a National Science Foundation research grant is a binding contract. Doesn't that end our job here? What, what, what more is there to say? No, Your Honor. There are cases like in Thermalon where there was a research grant that was found to have the elements of uh, a binding contract for the purposes of Tucker Act jurisdiction. However, as this case has opined in St. Bernard's Parish, Rick's Mushroom, and uh, Anchorage versus the United States, a case before the federal claims, uh, the determinative element again is direct consideration. And because that is lacking here, there is no jurisdictional hook. And again, the determinative element of consideration is necessary for there to be a presumption of damages under the act and for there again to be a money mandating statute. And so moving into the grant, the grant contract or the grant agreement here 
and the agreement at issue in Thermalon that our court has previously cited with approval? Your Honor, may you please repeat that question? I missed the first part. What is the distinction between the contract, the grant contract at issue in this case, uh, the one currently before us that you're arguing, and Thermalon, the contract at issue in Thermalon that our court has previously cited with approval? Your Honor, the, the case in Thermalon, again, cited that there was direct consideration. So there, the benefit to the government was the publication of plaintiff's research results, title to any equipment that the plaintiff had purchased would be turned over to the government, and also a royalty fee license and patent rights of intellectual property. Here, if you look to page 26 of the appendix, the program objective states that this program seeks to strengthen Cameroonian institutions to help Cameroon. The direct benefit here is not going back to the federal government, but rather going to the people of Cameroon and any- But, type but, of benefit but excuse me, counsel, but it's the, it's the United States federal government who decided that it was a good idea to do these things in Cameroon. Isn't the US government essentially buying a service from a democracy worldwide that it happens to be uh, deploying into Cameroon? No, Your Honor, we respectfully disagree with that analysis and that this is because this is a grant agreement, this is a uh, allocation of funds going to the grant grantee. And so just because that there is money being spent for a program that was generally conceived Ms. by Palmer, USAID. If that's, case, if that's the case, can the United States sue um, democracy worldwide for breach of the grant agreement? Let's say they don't perform. Can the, can the United States sue them for breach? Uh, no, Your Honor, I do not believe so. They, they could file, uh, they could request a reimbursement of costs, um, but not under, under different theories and not under breach of contract theories. And well, what if they, what if you paid them and they, it turns out that they had, instead of using it to um, provide services to Cameroon, they um, bought um, drinks at some airport lounge and spent fifty thousand dollars there. And um, how, how would how would the government get its money back? Your Honor, the court would the United States government could then, I, as I was saying, bring bring suit, but perhaps not under the breach of contract theory. That they could request another reimbursement from the uh, the, the money that they mis misallocated and disallowed under that they spent inappropriately um, back to the government. Um, can I, your um, opposing counsel talked about how the uniform requirements regulations are money mandating. Uh, can you address your position on that? Yes, your honor. Looking to the Tucker Act, there are two prongs in which a grantee must look to in order to find Tucker Act jurisdiction. So one is naming a provision of the constitution or regulation as the uh, appellant grantee has done here or finding an express or implied contract. And then in addition to this prong, a grantee must also identify a second, uh, the second prong which would be identifying a distinct substantive right of damages in which this court has named as money mandating. And so the uniform guidance in which the appellant grantee cites is just the regulation, but they fail to identify a money mandating statute. And moreover, the, the specific provisions that the appellant grantee does cite to in their brief um, on pages 12 through 13 are just guidance as to how these payments may be made and uh, are also payments contingent upon other circumstances, namely the settlement or closeout of a grant agreement and do not necessitate money mandating, which brings me to another point, your honors, and that looking to the grant agreement itself, there is no money mandating statute, and instead it's money authorizing. Wait a minute, you agree that a contract, in order to have, in order for us, to, uh, for the Court of Federal Claims to have Tucker Act jurisdiction, you can have contracts that are not procurement contracts, correct? That is correct, your honor. Okay, so to Judge Lester's earlier point, don't we normally presume money damages for breach? Yes, Your Honor, that is true. However, our position is here is that this is not, this is a grant agreement that is dissimilar from uh, either a traditional common law contract or a procurement contract. And so if there was breach, which there is not here, because 
uh, contractor grantee is seeking a greater allocation of funds under the grant, they're not seeking a claim for money damages. And I that you want. If the Bill Gates Foundation hires Democracy Worldwide to go provide the same services that the United States did here, and Democracy Worldwide doesn't provide them, can Bill Gates sue, can the Gates Foundation sue Democracy Worldwide for breach of contract? Yes, Your Honor, in certain circumstances, I think that might be. a bargain for detriment, right? What was that? Because it's a, there's a bargain for detriment. It's a common law, classic contract. I'm paying you to go do X. Go do it. Your Honor, this case is different for two main reasons that, than, the, than the hypothetical that you just proposed. First of all, this is a, uh, again, the contracting party is with the federal government, and therefore there has to be an express waiver of jurisdiction. Um, if, I mean, an express waiver of sovereign immunity for jurisdiction to exist, uh, which, which places them in a different context than it would be with another private entity. And the Tucker Act, the Tucker Act provides that express waiver as long as there's a contract. So all we have to do is find that there's a non-frivolous allegation of breach of contract, right? And that this is a non-frivolous assertion that this was a contract that was breached. And I'm, I'm just, I mean, we, we've already agreed that the Gates Foundation, if it had the same contract, could sue for breach. So what, dis, what distinguishes the Tucker Act's contract language from just any normal breach of contract suit? Again, Your Honor, the, the Congress has effectuated a specific intent when it was writing the Tucker Act that it would be a very narrow waiver. And it also requires, as I said, the second prong, which would be a money mandating statute. And so because there is no money mandating statute here, there is just a certain allocation of funds that would not render damages to be found more or less. It would just be rather a specific remedy that the plaintiff is seeking for monies that it believes that it is entitled to. And this is the issue that was decided in Bowen versus Massachusetts, a Supreme Court case uh, looking at the disallowance of a grant program there. Uh, and we find this case very persuasive in that there, similar to the case here, it was both uh, grant and aid programs whereby the state of Massachusetts sued the federal government for a cost disallowance under this grant award again, similar to the, the specific contracting vehicle of a grant here. And there the court decided that even though it was seeking monies past due, that these were not damages for the purposes of conferring Tucker Act jurisdiction as money mandating, even so though- the government the must remand this case back to the Court of Federal Claims with instructions to transfer it to the district court to be heard under the APA? That is correct, Your Honor. And this is also the case as found in uh, uh, the Federal Circuit and Lumi Tribe of the Lumi Reservation of Washington, whereby they looked at another housing pro they looked at another grant program, which was a uh, housing grant program uh, for Native Americans. And there they found again that because that was money authorizing the statute there under which it was found, it, the monies claimed, while similar to damages, were not damages in fact but rather against a specific remedy of equitable relief, as this is, again, an a, 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 some certain of an allocation of monies. And this is wholly dissimilar to this circuit's case in suburban mortgage, uh, where looking to the facts, uh, it was a breach of insurance contract, whereby housing and urban development refused to accept assignment of the mortgage and pay suburban the insurance proceeds. And so looking to the factual differences, we urge the court to look to precedent in which it was decided by grants because grants again are a wholly different contracting vehicle that have a wholly different set of procurement pr or of um, statutes and regulations that govern versus procurement contracts or other types of contracting vehicles. And can I, can I, can I just jump back then from where you are to the consideration issue? I mean, your opponent says that the uh, provision that really they're doing, what they're doing here is what USAID needs them to do. This is USAID's business. Um, how is that not sufficient to provide consideration a direct benefit to USAID? Your Honor, this is not direct consideration because in any interaction in which the federal government is pursuing uh, one of these types of contracting vehicles, there is going to be some sort of beneficial improvement that they're paying for. And so if you were to take under the assumption that every type of uh, payment to a grantee or a contractor 
uh, would be enough for the purposes of direct consideration would render every single grant and every single cooperative agreement a, co a procurement contract. And this would in, undermine the role is and intentions of Congress in defining the differences between these contracting vehicles and also the agency itself when it chose to use a grant agreement as a contracting vehicle for this specific program. And along those lines, looking to how Congress has defined grant agreements, they specifically cite in the Federal Grants and Cooperative Agreements Act that this is not for the direct benefit of the United States government, and it is not for acquiring property or services. I know, but we've already established that you can have a non-procurement contract, like take the Windstar contracts, where there's consideration, but it's not a procurement contract under the statute you just identified. It's not so, it doesn't involve, for example, appropriated funds. In other words, there's other ways for contracts to not be procurement contracts, and the Court of Federal Claims still has jurisdiction under the Tucker Act. That's correct, Your Honor. But in this case in particular, again, the direct benefit is not going to the, the United States government. Right. An which analogy. Means no, which means that it's not a procurement contract. And I agree with you. It's not a procurement contract. But so what? And so because it is, it's not a procurement contract and because so it is a grant agreement, Your Honor, that renders it, when looking to the terms of consideration outside the purposes of Tucker Act jurisdiction, but because there's no consideration, there's no money damages to be claimed, and then there's what's, no money mandating statute. What's wrong with concluding that all grant agreements, or maybe some grant agreements, or maybe just this grant agreement is still a Tucker Act contract? It's not a procurement contract. If it were, we'd be under the CDA in 1491A2. Instead, we're under 1491A1, A1 like we are in Windstar World. What's the difference? Uh, Your Honor, I see my time is up. May I briefly conclude? Uh, yes, oh, you can finish. You can answer the question. <laughs> Uh, Your Honor, again, looking to the way in which jurisdiction is interpreted, it must be effectuated by, jurisdiction must be defined by law, and it cannot just transcend those boundaries of law. And because Congress has not intended there to be uh, a waiver under of sovereign immunity for grants, uh, jurisdiction must be construed narrowly and is not found here. And for the foregoing reasons, again, Your Honors, we respectfully request that this court dismiss appellant's claim for lack of jurisdiction. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Plummer. Uh, Mr. Whitlow, you are up next, um, and you're addressing the contract issue, correct? Yes, Your Honor. All right, uh, so whenever you are ready. Good evening, and may it please the court. My name is Benjamin Whitlow, and I'm here on behalf of the APLI in this case, the United States Agency for International Development, who asked this court affirm the judgment of the Court of Federal Claims which disallowed democracy worldwide's cost for PPE, sanitation, and nurses' fees for three main reasons. First, democracy worldwide's costs were not reasonable because they did not comply with the terms of the grant award, and they ignored agency guidance to seek approval for COVID-19 related costs. Which term of the grant award did they not apply, comply with? Come again, Your Honor? Which term of the grant award did they not apply, comply with? Specifically, Your Honor, they did not comply with the budget to which they were bound. As Your Honor's discussed in my opposing counsel's argument, the grant award did contain a line item for- Where, uh, do, we, where do we see that the budget is uh, the end all and be all here, the be all and end all? Well, the reason why the budget is so important in this case, Your Honor, is because the terms of the grant award and indeed regulations at 2 CFR part 200, section 407 require that if you're going to have a budget revision, you need AO approval. And because democracies worldwide's cost for PPE, sanitation, nurses' fees were not contained within their budget. So, so, so hold on, hold on. If you're going to have a budget revision, you need AO approval. I don't disagree with your um, reading of the grant, uh, but that's if you're going to have a budget revision. And it looks from the email traffic like that was an open question all along, while the AOR and the AO were being told that DW was going to buy some PPE, there was no decision made that a budget agreement needed to be uh, amended. Isn't that right? Wasn't the contracting officer's final word on it? Well, we'll see later if we need a budget amendment. 
Yes, Your Honor, they did tell them that they would see if a budget realignment was needed, but then the burden is on democracy worldwide to go out and price out what they needed in the PPE, the sanitation, their nurses fees, and to come back to the agency saying, okay, these are the costs we're going to have, and then conduct the budget realignment. Well, well if that's the case, I'm looking at the particular regulation, which I had already open up on my screen here in anticipation that you might cite it in 407. Yeah. And 407 says specifically, quote, the absence of prior written approval on any element of cost will not in itself affect the reasonableness or allocability of that element unless prior approval is specifically required for allowability as described under certain circumstances in the following sections of this part. Is there some section of that part that specifically addresses the claim cost? Yes, Your Honor. If you, I, the a specific paragraph escapes me, but it says to revise budgets one in one of the listed areas there. So that is one place where the burden is on democracy worldwide to seek AO approval for a budget revision. It's also within the terms of the grant agreement. Also, as I will discuss, the agency's guidance said, if you're going to have need a budget revision for any COVID-19 related cost, you have to reach out to the AO. But didn't but, they, I mean, they did reach out to the AOR. They were having exchanges about it. I, I mean, this was, you know, in a very unique circumstance in a very weird time. Why, why should that not be enough in the instances, in the circumstances here? Well, I think for a couple of reasons, Your Honor. I think the first of which, the communications with the AO, or AOR rather, on the facts here cannot be an approval because the AOR doesn't have either actual express authority or actual implied authority. And USAID operational policy at chapter three states that AORs do, do not have the authority to make changes to the budget that affect the terms and conditions, or excuse me, uh, make changes to the budget that affect, or the grant award that affect the terms and conditions. Here, changing let, the let, I'm sorry, let me stop you there because um, again, I, I don't have the email exchange right in front of me, but somebody from the government used the word approved. Who, who was that? Well, the AOR asked the AO, is this approved? To which the AO responded, I think this is on page four of the appendix, says that PPE purchase must comply with the guidance on USAID's website. Part of that was if a budget realignment was required, you had to contact the AO. Okay, am I, am I recalling incorrectly something in the record. I thought somebody from the government wrote an email to somebody else and used the word approved period in response to a question about whether DW was going to buy PPE. So well, who, am I reading the record wrong or, or, or can you answer my question? Who in the government used that word? The AOR contacted Democracy Worldwide and said, you can purchase PPE so long as it complies with the guidance on the agency's website. And that goes back to if a budget revision was necessary, and this goes beyond just the PPE, because Democracy Worldwide didn't apprise the government of the nurses fees, the flat cleaning fee, or any of the other fees that are part of that $10,445. So because they didn't tell that to anybody at the government, specifically not anybody with authority, they cannot now say that they've gotten the approval that they were required. But if they had gone to the AO, I mean, would the AO really have denied this request? Mm -hmm. I mean, what else were they going to do in a time of COVID? Well, Your Honor, it's not the government's contention that under no circumstances could democracy worldwide have incurred costs of these types. But it's important, especially in a time when the government is incurring unknown costs from several different angles, like a pandemic, that the government have some control over the cost. And the approval process is there for the government to be able to work with the grantee, see what the options are, see what the alternatives are, and come up with the most effective solution. And if that power is taken away from the government and they can just read in cost into line items, especially when nothing in the line items suggests that those costs are there, these grants become unadministrable. And I think that brings up another point, Your Honor, which is that democracy worldwide seems to insinuate that just because of the exigent circumstances here, this obviated their need for approval. However, this court in Kellogg, Brown and Root Services versus the United States found that exigent circumstances alone are not by themselves enough to obviate the need to ensure reasonableness. Specifically in that case, a contractor operating under a contract in Iraq was constructing a dining facility and exceeded cost way over market price for the construction of the dining facility. He then argued, the contractor rather, then argued that the Court of Federal Claims, the court below, had failed to consider the exigent circumstances. But even in that case, the Federal Circuit said, even in exigent circumstances like war, 
that a contractor is still required to use their prudent business judgment. Likewise here, Democracy Worldwide, although there was a COVID-19 pandemic, was required to use their prudent judgment as a grantee and act under the grantee's guidance because the burden by the regulations is on Democracy Worldwide to ensure that they administer their award in accordance with the terms and conditions of the grant award, Your Honor. I mean, the, okay, the, um, the cost of thing Kurt, don't seem like they're crazy. I mean, they don't seem like they're things that would be outside the normal. I mean, going to nurses to figure out what they need to do because nobody knew what to do in March of 2020, buying PPE. Um, why, is, why is what they did unreasonable? Well, I think for a couple of reasons, one of which I already briefly stated is that the government needs the approval function in order to sort of see whether or not these costs are reasonable at all. Now, from the surface, it doesn't sound like these costs are unreasonable, but it was Democracy Worldwide's burden to bring them to the government so the government could figure out whether or not they were reasonable, even within their brief. Okay, 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 there we go. I went back to the record and I wanna follow up on my question, which relates to Judge Lester's question uh, on, on Joint Appendix 4, the AOR uh, said, looks like they need to purchase some mass PPE for their field uh, trainings. Is this approved? The AOR responded with the word agreed, forgive me, it was not approved. She was being asked if she approved and she said agreed. And then she went on to talk about that. And that's where the question of, uh, or my question earlier about whether um, there was even an agreement or a decision as to whether a budget realignment needed to be made. Did, didn't DW do everything it could and didn't the AOR run it up the chain and get actual uh, AO approval prior to the purchase of the PPE? Well, no, Your Honor, for two reasons. The first of which is that in the first instance, Democracy Worldwide didn't do everything they could do because they didn't inform the government of all the costs they were going to incur. They only said they might incur costs depending on Cameroonian regulations surrounding mask sanitation, et cetera. Secondly, in the email that Your Honor points to, she's saying in Mr. Willow, in terms Mr. Willow, on that point, can I have you turn to Joint Appendix 130, please? Yes, Your Honor. And that should be uh, the FAQs related yes, Your Honor, to yes. COVID PPE. Why is the first response from USAID on the top of 130 not pre-approval for all of its for all of its grantees. Um, could you repeat the question, Your Honor? I'm sorry, I missed it. Why is the USAID's response on the top of Joint Appendix 130 not a grant of approval for all of its grantees to pur to purchase COVID PPE? Ah, uh, yes, Your Honor. Although the government there is saying that these costs are generally allowable, the government can't give blanket guidance to every single grantee to simply purchase as they see fit. Now, read in conjunction with yes, other- but doesn't it show that pre-approval isn't required? No, Your Honor, it doesn't, because other parts of the guidance said before incurring COVID-19-related costs, you need to contact your AO or AOR or AO or AOR. Um, other parts of the guidance said if you need a revision, you need to get the AO's approval. So while these costs might, in a general sense, be reasonable, you still need to contact the government so they can ascertain the facts to determine if they are reasonable. Can you, address me, the, can you address the argument from your opposing counsel that the AO ratified the um, here? Yes, Your Honor. And this is actually my second point, which is that the AO did not ratify. So in order to show ratification, the appellant has to show two things, both full knowledge of the material facts by the AO and that she either acquiesced or adopted. Now, courts have found, specifically in Leonard versus United States and Strickland versus United States, that full knowledge requires a detailed factual knowledge of the situation, more than just a general knowledge. So for instance, in Strickland versus the United States, their contractor could not show that a contracting officer had full knowledge of the material facts about a subcontractor even though the contracting officer received weekly reports that one, the contractor or that the subcontractor was removing lead paint from a ship, that they were incurring additional cost, and that they were negotiating with the contractor for those additional costs. All the agreement officer was aware of here was that Democracy Worldwide might incur some cost depending on Cameroon's regulations. But Democracy Worldwide never apprised the, either the AOR or the AO of any specifics of those costs. For instance, what the line items were, how much they cost, or what the alternatives were. So there could not have been ratification because quite simply, she did not possess full knowledge of the material facts in this instance. Well, Further, I mean, didn't she know? She know 
knew generally what they were doing, at least on the PPE part, didn't she? Yes, Your Honor, but she still didn't have any idea about how much the PPE was going to cost or what quantity they were going to purchase at. And again, what, the- What does ratification take? What, I mean, what is there a test for that? Well, Your Honor, I think the, or the CBCA case of Mission Support Alliance here is instructive. So in that case, the contracting officer or the contractor tried to argue that it needed um, reimbursement for its insurance cost under that contract. However, because they did not give the contracting officer any of the information relating to the type of insurance it was purchasing, the cost of the premiums, or how it benefited the program, there could be no approval. So likewise here, Democracy Worldwide, based on the record, had 17 days between when they knew that these costs might be possible to when they actually had to start incurring these costs, but they didn't do anything in that interim time to prepare to price these out or inform the government of any of these specific costs. And as to my final point, Your Honor, the fixed price nature of this award shifted the burden from the government to democracy worldwide. The case of Pernick Cir in the case of Pernick Circo Joint Venture, a contractor operating under a firm fixed price contract, in that case, the CBCA disallowed their costs because under a firm fixed price contract, the burden is shifted. Uh, Council, let me interrupt you here. Um, I'm having trouble swallowing the whole firm fixed price argument. The, the, this was a grant of $2 million with specific budget items that had to be uh, stayed within, as you're arguing very forcefully, um, or if those particular items were going to be changed, specific AO approval had to be obtained. So every dollar, it seems, of that $2 million was in, in the hands, if you will, of the government, and it, it was not a here, go do things, and here's your $2 million, and, and we're walking away, and you have the risk. It was, we're going to interact with you during the course of this entire uh, grant and talk about budget, and we're going to amend the budget if we need to, et cetera, et cetera. That sounds a lot like a cost uh, plus contract, wouldn't you agree? So, so where is the risk uh, that DW um, assumed uh, or, the, or even where is a fixed price in this at all? Well, Your Honor, on page 22 of the appendix, it actually states that Democracy Worldwide is to, to receive a fixed $2 million sum for this award. Also, the agency there specifically disclaims responsibility for any amount over that award. This is, and the mechanics are quite different from a cost reimbursement contract, as long as the costs are within the terms of the budget. For instance, the government does not argue if, if Democracy Worldwide wants to go out and buy a bunch of pens, that's perfectly reasonable because it's in their budget. So it's quite different from a cost reimbursement contract in that way. And it serves the same purpose to encourage grantees to control costs. Um, they, don't get, they don't get the $2 million unless they only get the monies that they have paid reimbursed, right? Which may not be $2 million. Um, Your Honor, seeing as my time has expired, may I briefly answer your question and conclude? Um, you can. It's not a very good question, but... Um, Your Honor, it was my understanding from the terms of the grant award that Democracy Worldwide would receive their $2 million sum to carry out the, the purpose of their grant, of their grant award. Uh, and if the, something was in their budget, they could get it without seeking a budget realignment. And thus, Your Honor, for the foregoing reasons, uh, we ask this court reverse the judgment as to the jurisdictional issue and affirm as to the factual issue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whitlow and Ms. Plummer. Um, so the appellant has uh, about two minutes of rebuttal time. Uh, I don't know if Mr. Anderson or Ms. Hahn, who's going to handle the rebuttal? I will, Your Honor. All right. Uh, whenever you are ready, Mr. Anderson. Thank you. I'd like to address uh, two points regarding the jurisdictional argument. First, uh, as Judge Solomon asked about the availability of uh, remand to the uh, district court and the APA, However, um, my opposing counsel's argument regarding that availability missed the uh, impact of this court's decision in suburban mortgage, where first uh, the court should ask whether there is Tucker Act administration available and if it is sufficient. And if that, if that is found in the affirmative, that ends the discussion. And um, relatedly, the definition of money damages provided in Bowen was explicitly related to the Administrative Procedure Act. And the Supreme Court said that the 
definition or the requirement would be different under the Tucker Act, which is um, one of the bases upon which this court's decision in suburban mortgage rested so that it is not, uh, it doesn't matter effectively for Tucker Act purposes, whether the Bowen definition is met. Um, regarding the, uh, the question of the existence of a contract, uh, as again, Judge Mount Solomon noted, there are non-procurement contracts um, that are based on consideration. This court has never required a direct benefit in order for there to be a contract. Uh, and in as much as there is a concern about policing the boundaries and enforceability of, of offers of money, the, the principle of consideration uh, solves, serves that purpose adequately uh, and consistent with this court's precedent. And finally, uh, as all of the judges have noted, there is an element of circularity to the factual arguments uh, brought forth by USAID in the sense that, um, just Judge Solomon noted, uh, the, the uniform guidance would appear to allow uh, allowable, allocable, and reasonable costs. I, I see that my time is up. Your time is up. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Um, well, thank you for your presentations. And I believe that uh, Judge Solomon and Judge Smith and I are going to um, reconvene elsewhere and come back to you. Yes, thank you, Judge Lester. Yes, um, thank you and, and congratulations to the competitors for finishing. At this point, I would ask the judges to please mute their microphones, turn off their video cameras and join um, uh, Victoria in Google Meet to begin deliberations. Thank you. Uh, again, congratulations to the competitors. You are um, out of the hot seat now. Um, I'm going to go ahead um, and share my screen as now uh, Judge Summers will join me um, in announcing some of the other awardees uh, from this year's competition. So let me go ahead in one moment and share my screen. Thank you. And first, um, before we an announce the winners, we will be uh, talking about some of the people who were involved in this competition. So with that next slide, we'll be talking about the person who wrote the, pr the um, problem. The problem was complicated. Um, it's actually a realistic problem. Um, many of the judges have started to deal with these issues. And Roxanne Cassidy, known as Roxy, um, is a 3L at GW. She's a notes editor, um, editor for PCLJ. And following graduation, she will clerk for the Honorable Marianne Blankhorn at the United States Court of Federal Claims, which um, will be uh, really exciting for her as she has this great experience writing this problem. So um, we also have on the next slide, two really critical elements for the competition chairs. I've never had um, competition chairs in this in this moot court. So it's very helpful to have them. Um, first, Amanda McDowell, who was a finalist in last year's competition. She has served on the Moot Court Board, the ADR Board, and is the outgoing editor-in-chief of the Public Contract Law Journal. Um, upon graduation, she will join Kroll and Mooring as an associate. I don't know how either of them do this. They never sleep. Um, Morgan um, Huston, um, Houston competed in last year's competition. She has served as the articles um, editor on the Public Contract Law Journal and the secretary of the Government Contracts Student Association. And upon graduation, she will clerk at the Civilian Board of Contract Appeals, and we cannot wait to have her. So for the best contractor brief, we have Stuart Anderson and Jane Han. Congratulations, that's great. Congratulations. One of the downsides to doing this over the Zoom uh, webinar license is we can't see an audience reaction, but I know that all of you out there uh, that are watching this are cheering loudly in your room, so congratulations. Yes, and thank you too. I noticed I'm um, going through the list of attendees. Not only do we have our classmates, but we also have a lot of former um, Moot Court co competitors from the um, previous classes and also um, some lawyers, partners, and friends who are also watching. So thank you for that as well. So for the next award, we have the best government brief, which is Benjamin Whitlow and Madison Plummer. So congratulations. That's you know a double plus for you guys. Um, such a great job and really pleased. And let me say for the rating of the briefs, we actually had the former um, editors-in-chief for the PCLJ who volunteered their time to um, do a really close edit and really close weighing of these briefs. So I feel confident that um, you did a really good job because that's a very tough crowd. So next we have best overall competitor, 
Nicole Villy and Brad Bush. And that was basically based upon not just their competition, but also their uh, the things that they gave in the classroom setting to help and just lead our team. So, you know, I'm really I'm really pleased that um, we have this best over a competitor. And then our next group is best oral advocate. Brittany Carapas. So congratulations, Brittany. That was really an awesome job. And then next we have excellence in oral advocacy. And this is um, a little bit different. This is the excellence shown based upon the scores that were received in the in the uh, previous round. So Emily Friedman and Nicholas um, Feldstern, um, congratulations on your excellence as recognized by the judges. And excellence in written advocacy we have two other teams. We have Alex Shepard, Ustina Abraham, um, and then we also have Catherine Kyoto and um, El um, Elaine Elena Hoffman, whose name I endlessly mispronounce. And I apologize. Congratulations on the Excellence Award. So thank you. We're just going to be waiting here now for the judges to come back. Um, sometimes we have music. Um, I don't have the music to provide. <laughs> I, so. can, I can sing for you if you'd like. No, I can. I can. So I'll talk about the um, the genesis of this moot court competition. So for years, the competition was like a traditional competition where um, the students signed up and then they just were given a date. They did um, prep on their own and they just competed. And at times, this competition had um, more than thirty teams. Um, you know, at the very beginning part. So when the um, law school decided to try an experiential class. This was the one that was chosen. So what that means is that the students actually learn how to do things by practice. They actually experience um, the learning process that they would have um, in person. So instead of just competing, they get to experience experts who come in and talk to them about writing briefs and about how to present and just about working with a teammate. and. So I think that that was a really exciting part of this program. This is the fourth year of the competition, and every year it's a little bit different, a little bit um, challenging because the, the the I don't know if you know, but the problems that are written are cha they change every year. So um, sometimes it's a prior student who writes it. Um, last year it was a former student who is now at a at Arlo and Porter. So those are the things that they experience with that. Um, we also have, uh, at the beginning, we have uh, Mary Kate, who is from the law school, and she trains them on how to do research, which, you know, they've, they've had basic training on that, but this is a little bit of a step up. We also do, um, early on, a personality test, just so they can see where they lie in personality skills and how to work best with their partner and um, learn how to balance out their normal tendencies versus the tendencies of their partner. So those types of things are the foundations of the beginning of the program. Then after that, we typically have a discussion about how to write. Um, we break out to breakout sessions um, where they are work talking with the people on their same side so they can figure out what some of the arguments are. And what was most fascinating about this is that even though they have the same problem and they have the same approach, what you find is that the argument approaches are, are very different. The way that they see the problem leads to different um, types of things that they'll focus on. So, you know, we, we saw what these two teams did. Other teams did different approaches, and I and it was really interesting. Jessica? Um, so I also, um, thank you for giving that nice overview of our class. It, it does make our competition unique among competitions in the law school, the fact that this is an experiential course um, and that they do receive experiential credit, which is a requirement by the American Bar Association. I will say though, like I say to all students, uh, even though we award two credits compared to the one that students typically receive, moot courts are deceivingly difficult. You do a lot of work for very little credit. So, so kudos to the teams that work so hard this entire semester semester uh, to put in the time and effort to to go to class every week, you know, participate in cl class, work very hard and prepare so well for these uh, oral uh, arguments. Let me say one more thing. Um, as I said at the outset, uh, we are so grateful to the generous contributions of Arnold and Porter, who, is, who has been our partner um, in running this competition. Um, all of our, our awardees will be receiving cash prizes as part of uh, their participation. So um, awardees that, are, that have been named tonight, um, including um, 
and the finalists will be receiving cash prizes. I will not be announcing the amounts, uh, but I will just say you'll be receiving cash prizes. Um, one other thing I wanna do is thank everybody for their ad uh, adaptation to this virtual setting. It's incredibly challenging on some levels. Uh, for the organizers, it was a little easier for us. We didn't have to run room to room over the weekend, um, making sure everyone was settled. But uh, you know, technical issues or other sorts of things um, can make it challenging. As you can see, the, the amount of time and effort it went into having to figure out how the judges could deliberate quietly without people hearing took some time and testing, um, but hopefully we will be able to readmit them when they tell us the finalists. Um, I will say this because um, uh, the our current uh, finalists and the finalists from last year were not able to celebrate properly. As many of you know from uh, past competitions, Arnold and Porter usually sponsors a, a beautiful reception in honor mm -hmm. of our finalists. Uh, because we've been, been unable to have those receptions, we will be honoring last year's finalists and this year's finalists um, in spring of, of 2022, when I'm certain we can be back together in a group. Uh, I don't think we'll be limited by size hopefully by then, um, uh, or hopefully not masked. Um, so my hope is to honor you separately and honor your your successes um, in a separate event coming up. So, so more information will be provided to you. And of course, last year's finalists as well um, for this. So I'm just being told from Victoria in the chat, oh, here come the judges. So let's wait till they all join us and hopefully we will get Judge Smith back online. Um, and I see Victoria's here. And now we're just waiting. Oh, Judge Solomonson. And now we just need Judge Smith to come back in. I do not see him. I see his box. I'm asking him to start his video. Um, I see that his audio is getting ready to connect. Oh, he's back. And with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to the judges uh, to provide their feedback and announce the winners. Thank you. Um, well, Judge Summers, how, how do you want us to do this? Do you want us to announce? And, and talk a little bit or talk a little bit and then announce or? Um, I think because our students really want to hear the feedback first. I think you should talk a bit first and then make the announcement. Okay. Um, well, I, I will start. Um, so, so I uh, want to thank all four of you for uh, really doing a great job. All of you did a great job. And I can see why you're the four finalists. Um, I worked at Justice for a long time, and I um, mooted a ton of attorneys. That was part of my job as an assistant director was to do moots. And um, I can tell you that you did a much I know you did a much better job than some of the attorneys sometimes did <laughs> in their moots at Justice. So um, uh, you should take a lot of pride in first getting to this point in the moot court competition, but also in your performances today, because I, I think everybody really did well. Um, and you acted as though you were real attorneys in a court. Uh, so uh, I appreciate it. even in this bizarre Zoom world that we're living in right now. <clears throat> I know things are different if you go into court, but um, you know, this is, you, you did a great job with the situation we're in. Um, so I guess I'll just sort of go through, talk to each individual. Um, Mr. Anderson, uh, I thought you, you, like I said, I, I really appreciate all the effort you, you put into it. You knew your case, you knew uh, your arguments, you were very well-spoken, uh, you were very measured in what you were saying. So I appreciated that. You knew the record and I don't, um, uh, and, and you, uh, were, were persuasive. Um, so I, uh, I, I don't have any negative thing to say beyond that. <laughs> um, Matt or uh, Judge Solomon and Judge Smith, do you have anything you want to bring up or add or? So, so um, just a quick, this is more of a pointer and it goes to the, um, both of the um, DW's uh, lawyers. Judges ask questions for all sorts of different reasons. Sometimes they they truly want to know what you have to say. Other times they're trying to draw out arguments that will be used later in the argument. And other times they're trying to uh, sort of talk through you or through their questions to the other judges if they already know that they are going to in, uh, be involved in a debate. So that's kind of what I was doing with you guys. I think that um, 
I, I, I was I was essentially trying to draw out strong points um, in your case to get you to to see if you'd take the bait and emphasize them or kind of sometimes people react to judge questions like they're always hostile and I have to get defensive and to react to that accordingly. I think you handled it well, uh, but that's that's my practice pointer for you too going into the future um, is to remember that all questions are not always a challenging question. Right, and I think you both, uh, you got the, the, the problem with the record, not really telling us how much of a percentage the money's actually spent on the COVID related materials versus the 2 million, how much of that was actually sent, we don't really know. So I, I don't think that's actually in the record. So you're, you know, you, you, but I think you did fine dealing with it. Uh, and Ms. Hahn, uh, one thing I wanted to say specifically to you, I thought you, well measured in terms of your response. Um, you, you didn't speed up, you didn't rush. You know, I could always understand what you were saying. You were always thinking, um, you see that you were thinking. And I uh, think that that is a great skill to a talent to have really, to be able to stay focused and measured that way throughout the entire argument. So that, that was a one point I actually really noted um, and, and um, not not everyone has that uh, skill so or talent. I don't know which one. Maybe it's a bit of both. Um, I'm, I'm just going to finish mine and I'm going to let you guys just jump in with general comments if you want. Ms. Plummer, I um, also, again, thought you did a great job. One thing that I really liked that you did, and I noted this, I wrote this down as you did it because I thought this is something that a lot of people don't in court. Judge Solomon, I can't ask Solomon, I can't remember what the question was, but it was something not favorable to your case. And um, you said, yes, Your Honor, you acknowledged it. You just admitted he's right. So many people in court don't do that. They will dance around it. They'll say, you know, isn't it true that your client, you know, stole this money from wherever? Your Honor, the stars over here are blah, blah. You know, they don't just, they don't the bad facts and when you dance around credibility and you didn't do that you you just acknowledged it it was like sure of course that's a that's a great thing to do um and that was one one thing i really uh, wrote down that everyone should do and they and they don't when they go to, go to act court it, it irritates judges like crazy um so um and again you you were thinking the whole time um and i i loved the loved the part um, when you started getting into it with Judge Solomson, who was who was a questioner for you um, about going to the district court, <laughs> when you when you pulled that out, I was like, oh, that's great. <laughs> so I liked your preparation for that. <laughs> Finally, Mr. Whitlow, a great job. Um, you're very very articulate. Uh, I, I don't want to say you're a smooth talker, but you're you're very good on your feet. Uh, and really well prepared. You knew your record really well. So I appreciated that. Um, there was one point uh, when I was asking you about ratification, I thought you were getting a little excited. So you started speeding up uh, a little bit too much. So that would be one thing just to, you know, you don't get too uh, worked up and that you stay measured, but it also um, identifies the fact that you're passionate about what you're talking about. So. Again, I thought each of you did a great job. So I, I appreciate all the time you put into it. Matt, or Brian, do you want to add anything else before we go to the uh, end? Yeah, yeah. Sure, just just briefly and similar to what I told the um, appellants, uh, I saved the harder questions for the government in this situation. And that is of course the, the raw test of how well you respond to the negative aspects of your case and to the arguments that aren't your best. And, and I think both of you handled yourselves very well. And I agree with Judge Lester about um, Mr. Whitlow, you're very smooth on your feet and very good for uh, good at responding to questions, both easy and difficult. Yeah, I, I admit I had a little bit of an ax to grind on the jurisdictional issue. And so uh, Ms. Plummer got the brunt of it, but she did a great job and rolled with the very difficult questions. I'm actually really curious to know whether you were prepared to concede the transfer question or you just did that in advance. Either way, it was very impressive. Um, whether you thought about it, which was 
something I don't know that I would have thought about in your position or whether you just decided on the spot. Um, in either case, uh, to Judge Lester's point, it was very well done. Um, and um, and you, I just thought you did a great job. Um, and I thought all to echo Judge Lester, all, all the competitors uh, were, were are quite good, well ahead of their educational years. And, um, you know, either the plaintiff's bar or the Justice Department someday will be lucky to have you. Um, so with that, um, have any questions for us? No, I, I'm not going to ask that. <laughs> we'll be here all day. So, <laughs> um, uh, Judge Summers, should I just announce the who who we selected? Yes, you should. Thank you, Judge Lester. So much buildup. <laughs> um, so, uh, it was a tough call. Um, uh, it could have gone either way, but uh, in the end, uh, we uh, decided that the winners tonight were. Um, the team of Plummer and Whitlow. Um, so congratulations, congratulations all four of you for, um, for all your participation today and, and the great jobs that you did. Fantastic job, everyone. Thank you so much. And thank you to the judges for all the hard work and the good commentary afterwards was really, really great. Yeah, I think um, I know we have some Winnells that are, are watching tonight too, and I, they're getting ready to prepare for their very first new court arguments. So, so I'm sure that those comments are appreciated. Thank you for your time um, and, and energy. Thank you to everyone who helped make this competition possible. Judge Summers, uh, her team, uh, the course, the, the author, the people that you know chaired the competition, uh, and uh, again the judges, and of course Arnold and Porter, and then finally to our finalists. Thank you uh, for all your hard work and effort and congratulations to you, all the finalists. Oh, oh, yes, please. I was just saying congratulations and also congratulations to you, Dean Tillman, and also to Victoria, because without you guys pulling it together, we would have been doing it, I don't know where. <laughs> I was, I would yeah, say a I, lot I, of- I would just add too that the case I thought was very realistic. This is exactly, I think, what all, all of us uh, Judge Summers and, and, and Judges Smith and Lester, I think we see very similar cases. This is absolutely a real world experience for you. And so uh, congratulations to whoever designed the problem. Any, anybody else have any final thoughts, Victoria? No, oh, it was just a pleasure to be back and see this competition run again. And thank you for the judges. Um, you all really make this competition worthwhile for the competitors. Um, the feedback's great. It really helps them in the real world. So thank you. Well, well, we'll hope to see all of you in our courtrooms someday. And I think I'm the only one who knows how this ends. <laughs> because we've, this is only the second time we've done it by Zoom. So all we do is start clapping and then the music comes on or no music and we fade to black. Part where I sing again. <laughs> the judges missed it. I had a great performance. I'm going to give up my day job and become a professional singer. <laughs> thank you, everybody. And, and thank you from the GW Law Government Procurement Program for, for joining us tonight. And, and thank you again. And have a wonderful e evening, everyone. We will see you next year in person. All right. Take care. Everybody. Good night. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you.